a massive power vacuum in the east. Under normal circumstances, going with just one emperor was a dicey proposition. And I'm not really counting Valentinian II in all of this, since no one else seems to be either. But given the absolutely dire circumstances facing Rome, going with just one emperor would have been insane. So, it was time to play everyone's favorite game, let's pick a new emperor. And remember, if you accidentally back the wrong man, or speak out against the man who ultimately does win the prize, then your career will most likely be over, and you may even wind up dead. So good luck everyone, let's play the game. But even though the need to fill the power vacuum was acutely felt by everyone, when they finally did land on a candidate they could agree on, they did not just elevate him to the purple right away. Instead, they gave him military jurisdiction over the shattered Balkan provinces to see how he would handle the crisis. Only after passing this initial test would the candidate be elevated to the purple, which he was, but not until almost six months after Valens disappeared at Adrianople. So what is the name of this future emperor? Why, Theodosius, of course. Now, at the end of episode 150, I hinted at the fate of Valentinian's Mr. Fixit, Theodosius the Elder. But in the confusing rush of events that followed Valentinian I's death, I neglected to follow up on that hint. So, I will do so now. You would think a resume as sterling as the elder Theodosius's would have given him a measure of protection in the post-Valentinian realignment. But alas, men that capable often make enemies as easily as they solve problems, and Theodosius was no exception. The clique of high officials who came to power immediately after Valentinian's death was no fan of the elder Theodosius. We don't know why he was disliked, but historians have speculated that the execution for treason of a particular general who was close to the clique by Mr. Fixit while he was serving in Britain was a potential catalyst for Theodosius's ultimate demise. Sadly though, not only do we not know what the exact charges were that brought him down, we don't even know who authored the charges. That is, whether they sprang from the court of Gratian or the court of Valentinian II. Whatever the charges were, though, and wherever they came from, Theodosius the Elder was executed in 375 while he was still in North Africa attempting to sort out the mess created by Romanus. The fate of Theodosius's nearly 30-year-old son during the next few years is equally difficult to nail down. What we know for sure is that Theodosius the Younger was serving as a commander in Moesia around the timing in Spain, and then later still, we find him back in charge of troops in Thrace. But the timeline is garbled. The most commonly told version of the story, though, is that the younger Theodosius was caught up in the intrigues that brought down his father, and he was driven out of public service. He then retired to his home in Spain, where he married, started a family, and likely expected to pass the rest of his days living the comfortable life of a country aristocrat. But then the wheel of destiny rolled over on the plains near Adrianople, and Gratian recalled Theodosius the Younger from retirement and ordered him to take charge of the shattered legions of the Middle Empire. This version of the story relies on conjecture that there had been a turnover in the upper rungs of Gratian's court that brought to power a group of officials who had been friends of the elder Theodosius and knew the abilities of his son. It also relies on conjecture that all the high-ranking military officials in the East who had survived Adrianople were all now discredited by the defeat, and that the Emperor was looking for a man untainted by the recent debacle to come in and salvage the situation. There is another, less repeated version of the story that has Theodosius initially sacked not by a malicious clique targeting his family, but by Valentinian himself. Why? Well, because Theodosius was being held responsible for the failure of one of his legions during the Quadi raid that had followed the diplomatic blunder of Marcellianus. This version goes on to report 
that Theodosius was almost immediately reinstated to the army following the ascension of Gratian. So in this telling, Theodosius was actually serving in Illyria at the time of Adrianople, and the reason he was chosen to go salvage the situation in Thrace and Moesia was that he was the nearest commander of noble Roman birth available to Gratian at that moment. So his elevation to power was more a coincidence of proximity than anything else. To be honest, I have only ever heard the version that Theodosius was in Spain, and didn't know there was even an alternate until I started doing research for these episodes. But Dr. David Woods of the University College of Cork thinks that we've been misreading unreliable sources for years, so I thought I'd throw it out there. Whichever way it happened, after Adrianople, Gratian and his advisors decided that the now 32-year-old Theodosius was the man for them. As I just mentioned, though, the initial promotion did not come with purple robes. Instead, Theodosius was simply given overall military command of Moesia and Thrace, the two provinces presently qualified as national disaster areas. His mandate? Oh my god, try to restore some order. Theodosius spent the next six months getting a handle on the situation, trying to reorganize what was left of Valence's army, and ensuring that the various cities of the region could hold out without relief for a little while. Because, be aware, no relief will be coming for a little while. He acquitted himself well enough during this trial period that the further promotion, the one that really had been his to lose, was now offered. On January 19, 379 AD, in a ceremony at Sirmium, Theodosius was elevated to the rank of Augustus. He was given command over all of Valens' territories, with one notable addition. The western diocese of Illyria, which had traditionally been controlled by the western Augustus as they protected the passes into Italy, were ceded over to Theodosius in order to create a unified theater of operations. Though he was now emperor of the whole of the Eastern Empire, Theodosius's new mandate was crystal clear. Defeat the Goths. But that was, of course, easier said than done. As we've seen, reinforcements could not just be called in from elsewhere. The empire was stretched as thin as it was going to stretch. So Theodosius had to spend the next year raising and training a whole new army. At this point in history, there were three sources of new soldiers for Theodosius to draw on, and he drew from all of them to help fill his ranks. First, there were retired veterans, whose discharge contracts required them to return to service should the emperor deem it necessary. Second, there were raw draftees, yanked from civilian life, and third, there were barbarian fighters not aligned with the barbarian fighters the Empire was currently fighting. The first needed only be notified that they were being recalled. The second needed only be drafted. And the third needed only be paid. As Theodosius found out, though, the first and third sources of troops were fairly easy to manage. But that second source turned out to be a sticking point. Many people have asked why an empire as large as the Roman Empire ever had trouble with military recruitment, especially since they were able to replace their armies practically overnight when they were just a regional Italian power. A big part of the problem is something that Theodosius is about to find out. Very few people these days are crazy enough to want to join the army. Life in the army of late antiquity was harsh, uncomfortable, dangerous, and just swarming with draconian punishments of every shape and size. Only the phony tough or the crazy brave willingly signed up for a life that promised little more than a choice between death by disease, death by sword, or death by a senior officer who had woken up on the wrong side of the cot. Part of the reason Diocletian instituted the laws that forced men to inherit their father's profession was to keep the ranks of the army reasonably well stocked. Otherwise, the frontiers would have wound up unmanned two generations back. 
but compounding the problem of soldiering being a really unattractive profession was the attitude of rich landowners. Though their enlightened self-interest should have, after all, being rich doesn't count for much when your empire is undefended, but unfortunately, the immediate self-interest of the landowners usually led them to do everything in their power to hinder military recruitment. The manpower shortage that afflicted the army was just an extension of the more general manpower shortage that was afflicting the whole empire, and every poor sod who joined the army was one less poor sod available to work the enormous estates of the landowners. So what wound up happening is that when the draft officials came around demanding a landowner provide his quota of poor sod, the landowner would lie about how many poor sods he had. When pressed, the landowner might hand over the oldest, lamest, and feeblest of his workers, but the best of the bunch would usually be hidden away from view. This willful obstruction of military recruitment during a national security crisis enraged the emperors, and a series of laws threatening horrible punishment to anyone who held able-bodied men back flew out of the imperial courts, usually to no avail. It was also well known to soldiers already in service that if they decided to desert and they managed to make it to a large estate, that the owner would often secretly shelter them in exchange for a pledge of servitude. This was also well known to the emperors, and so another series of laws came flying out of the imperial courts prohibiting the practice, again, usually to no avail. This tension between the economic interests of large landowners and the military interests of the state was, you guessed it, another one of the 257 different reasons why the Western Empire is nearing collapse. When Theodosius finally gathered up an army large enough to maybe do something about the Goths, he drilled them and trained them and drilled them some more. But despite all the training, Theodosius' army was never going to be more than a ragtag bunch of misfits. The recalled veterans were experienced, but they were old. The new recruits were young, but not at all professional soldiers, and, having been pressed into service, their morale was low and their desertion rate was high. And then there were the auxiliary barbarians, some of whom were ethnically goth. Who knew where their loyalties lay? Theodosius was smart enough then to do two things. First, for the whole of 379, he never risked putting this army into battle. Not only would a loss have been catastrophic, but given the gulf of ability between the seasoned Goths and the Green Romans, a loss was very likely going to be the outcome. This meant that the Goths had a full year during which they basically had the run of the Middle Empire. But still, a Roman loss would have been catastrophic. It simply could not be risked. The other thing Theodosius was smart enough to do was not treat this army like a professional force of willing volunteers. Discipline was tight, but not draconian. Deserters were not killed as long as they came back. Floggings for minor infractions were kept to a minimum. He needed these men to fight for him someday. Beating them mercilessly because they weren't digging that hole right would have been counterproductive. Not that any of this really mattered. It would have made for a heartwarming story had this 